pick up my shirt of faith beside my fellow soldiers and just like the scriptures won't we see love growing colder with every determined pearl I'm more confident and bolder you steady me and carry me the weight is on your shoulder there's only one God sent suffering Savior and your gospel My name is David. Today we're going to be in Romans chapter 5. And we've been going through the book of Romans, you know, and it, it struck me last week as we were going through it, how we can feel, I think, like the Bible is unapproachable. It can be complex. It is complex. The things we're going to be digging into today are, are rich because the scriptures that we're opening are the divine symphony composed by the Holy Spirit through many different people and cultures over thousands of years to reveal the infinite God to us. So it's big, right? It's, it's grand. And it is, in a sense, it's, a, it's appropriate that it's intimidating. But that doesn't mean that it is at all unapproachable because... He promises to teach us. And he's given it to us for our sake. He wrote it for your sake. He tells us in James chapter 1, if anyone lacks understanding, ask God. Because he gives it generously, liberally, without reproach. He's not angry that you struggle to understand. He gets it. And he gives wisdom. He invites you into the process. He wants you to, to ask him questions. So today, I want to invite you to, to consider the way we're going to go through. I'm going to be taking this, you know, sort of just piece by piece. And I want to encourage you to take this as sort of a model for how you can be reading your Bible on your own at home, if that's not something that you're doing. Because God's intention is not that you would come and need Sunday morning to be the time that you read the Word. Sunday mornings, the times of us coming together, are primarily about us coming together, seeking Him together, worshiping Him together. His intention is for you to be able to talk to Him, read His Word all the time. So you, this that we're going to be doing today is just to, to get us started. It's to catalyze the process. But you can be reading the scriptures at home, on the bus, at work, whatever, because he's with you and he will teach you. So as we jump in now, Romans chapter 5, we're going to be, you know, we've, we've been looking at, it, particularly over the last couple of weeks, God's invitation to receive his righteousness, righteousness through faith. And he tells us now, Romans 5, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord, our King, Jesus, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only that, we also glory in tribulations, suffering, trials, knowing that those things produce perseverance. Perseverance produces character, and character produces hope. Now, again, over the last couple of weeks, what we've been looking at is this idea of justification by faith and, and receiving salvation by looking to Jesus rather than, he, says, he contrasts that with the idea of trying to earn your salvation. He's like, no, you, you have to just look to him for it, receive it from him. And he says, now in light of that, we have peace with God. We can rest the word for peace with God is rest. He says, knowing what God's shown us now, we stand in his grace. Which, again, this is one of those places where it's a word that we use that sometimes we're not sure what we mean when we say it. It just means his, it's his delight his, and even his empowering, his support, his care for us. We stand in that and rejoice in the hope 
of the glory of God. And that even enables us to rejoice in suffering, he says, because suffering strengthens us, right? It creates perseverance, creates character, and it creates hope. It, it, it stirs up our expectation of the good that God promises us. Doesn't that all sound great? And then I think so often we're like, but why don't I feel it? I read it, but it's not my experience. And when that happens, when we read what God says and our experiences don't line up, that is an invitation to ask him, to press in, to understand what he's saying. If we look back at this passage, notice the source that he lays out. He says over and over and over and over and over and over and over through Romans 5, by Jesus, through Jesus, according to Jesus. The first point I want to draw out today is that it is through Jesus that we have access to these things. And that is operating on a couple of levels because on the one hand, as we've looked at over the last couple of weeks, I'm not going to get into as much today, we have access through Jesus' pardon, right? The, the sacrifice Jesus made bought our pardon. He paid our debt. So we have access through his sacrifice. But there's more to it than that. He says in 2 Peter chapter 1 that his divine power has given to us everything that pertains to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust and lust here is not just sexual desire what he's he's not talking about that he's talking about the broader slavery to appetite. Through Jesus, we become partakers of the divine nature, escaping the corruption that is in the world through our slavery to appetite. And in Colossians chapter 1, Paul says, I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. The mystery which was hidden from ages and generations, but now has been revealed to his saints, to his people. Because to them, God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, the nations, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. For thousands of years, God's plan that he had hidden, that he hadn't fully revealed in the way that he was seeking to undo the work of the enemy, his plan was to restore us by putting himself in us. That's what it means to be born again, born of the spirit, spiritually alive, partakers of the divine nature. Christ in you. If you have trusted in Jesus, he has filled you with his spirit, with himself. And I'm calling our attention to it today because we lose sight of it. We, we forget it. And we show that we forget it because we live out of our own resources only or our act in accordance with our old nature, forgetting that we have him inside of us to draw on and strengthen us, to lean on him. He tells us in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You shall be witnesses to me to the end of the earth. 
we experience the power of God to walk in the things that he's promised us and called us by leaning on him. There is an active relational thing here. If you're struggling to rest in the peace that God has given you, if you're struggling to rejoice in the hope of God's glory, to look forward to him, if you're struggling to rejoice and have the strength and perseverance and suffering that he speaks of here, hear the invitation to lean on him for it. And the invitation is urgent. He tells us in Revelation 3, he says, Jesus said to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans, write, these things says the amen, the faithful, and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works. You're neither cold or hot. I wish you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth because you say I am rich. I've become wealthy. I have need of nothing and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. Anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. And look, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him. He with me, to the one who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This is to the churches. He's warning the ones who lost their zeal for him. And his invitation, he says, be zealous, be passionate again. Turn back. Repent just means to turn. And open up to him. Not so he can turn over tables. Or he doesn't say, I'll come in and rip out the floors and remodel the house. What he says is, "Come, let me in and I will dine with you. It's an invitation to fellowship. And he warned us in John 15 that we need to lean on him, abide in him, like the branch and the vine to be woven together, to stay connected. He said, that's how you bear fruit. That's how this abundance flows out of you. He warned us in Matthew 25, to stay supplied with oil. And over and over he gives that as a picture of his Holy Spirit, as the Spirit in us, as the the oil that supplies us. He says, keep the lamp burning by staying supplied with oil. He says, watch and be ready. Because there is a danger, right? He wouldn't warn us if there wasn't a danger of disconnection. He speaks about this in terms of you, got, you need to just hold on to overcome, to sit with him on his throne. I mean, what a kind picture, right? Like when I pull my kids up on my lap, he's like, you'll sit with me, but you have to hold tight. You need to depend on him for the strength to be able to hold tight, to hold fast. So how is your heart toward him? Is there somewhere that he's been knocking? Inviting you to connect with him. He's 
surprised me lately with this of just how simple it is to turn my attention back. To, he's in me. And I'll be wrestling with something. And he'll rem- I feel that sense. Of, he's like, hello, I'm still here. And it's just the, the little adjustment in my perspective that I needed. You know, the little awareness that he's here. I don't have to fight for this. I don't have to make my peace with God. He's made the peace. He will help me persevere. So let me encourage you, if you have been wrestling with this, if you've been wrestling to rest with God, to have peace with God, or wrestling to persevere, wrestling to look forward to the hope that he promises, lean on Jesus for it. Ask him to help you. Turn your attention to him and ask him to, to change your perspective or to give you the strength or to, to help you feel his peace. To direct your heart to the hope that he promises. And I want to dig us into that a little bit more here. Verse 5. He says, now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. When we were still without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Scarcely for a righteous man would one die, but perhaps for a good man somebody would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, he died for us. Much more than now, having been justified by his blood, we will be saved from wrath through him. Because if when we were his enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more, having been reconciled, we will be saved by his life. Not only that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we've now received the reconciliation. This, that first verse there, verse 5, man, that is so confusing to me. Because hope disappoints all the time. Right? I mean, we hope for things that do not seem to, to meet our need all the time. So, was, again, this is an invitation to wrestle with him about it. What does it mean? Why are you saying that? Because it really doesn't, that does not sound like my experience. But he's not saying that we never get disappointed. What he's saying is this, the deep hope through Jesus never disappoints. And... That's the second point I want to make. I'm going to explain a little bit. But point number two is that through Jesus, hope does not disappoint. In Romans 8, 18, Paul said, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation, the earnest expectation of the created natural universe, the creation, is eagerly waiting for the revealing of the children of God. Because creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Jesus said in Luke chapter 12, don't seek what you should eat or drink or have an anxious mind. Don't be setting your heart on those things. All these things the nations of the world seek after, and your Father knows that you need them. Seek the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added to you. Do not fear, little flock. It is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. So sell stuff that you've got right now and give alms. Provide for yourselves money bags that don't grow old, a treasure in the heavens that does not fail. Because there no thief approaches nor moth destroys. And where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now, when we read these passages, 
I think we turn them into abstractions. We think of it as suffering is bearable because God is nice, or suffering is bearable because good things are going to happen, or we hear Jesus saying, give to the poor, period. But there's so much more that he's saying. Jesus doesn't say, don't be attached to treasure. He says, don't give your heart to treasure right now because your heart is going to go where the treasure is. He says, store up treasure, but store it up where it doesn't get eaten or taxed or stolen. Like, make wise investments. He's not saying don't be, de be detached, be dispassionate. He's saying be smart. There is a treasure to be had that's worth investing in. The ache that we feel, that we try to satisfy now, he says the things that you set your heart on right now often do not satisfy. They're insufficient. Doesn't mean we shouldn't engage with them, right? You, you need to eat. You need to drink water. He's not saying don't eat, don't drink. But recognize that there's a deeper thing. Don't set your heart on the short-term fulfillments. The ache in your soul that is never satisfied right now was made to be fulfilled. Every piece of that ache, the ache for connection and beauty and joy and like power, the power to create, the power to do things well, to do things that are significant, all of that is given by God to begin now and to continually be fulfilled through eternity. All your hopes are made to be fulfilled. Not always in the way you envision it right now. Sometimes in the way we expect it now. Oftentimes more fully through eternity. He tells us in Ecclesiastes 3.11, he's deliberately put eternity in our hearts. We're made for so much more than we experience right now. And it's his good pleasure, it's his delight to give you the kingdom. And so he says, so set your heart on the kingdom. Set your heart on the fulfillment of all that. Don't get caught up in the moment where everything gets eaten and rusted and destroyed anyways. Put your investment, invest your time, invest your heart in the treasure that doesn't fade. And he tells us that this ache, this fulfillment, I mean this desire for fulfillment, this desire for connection and joy and fun and friendship and all these things, all these aches that we have, we can be confident that they will be fulfilled because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts. He says, hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in your hearts. And he explains, right, if God loves us so much that he already gave us his son while we were his enemies, don't you think that if now that he's made us his friends, now that he's freed us from the corruption, he's going to be that much happier to share everything with us? If he didn't withhold his son, if he's given us himself inside of us? He said in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, 21 and 22, that it is God who establishes all of us. Paul was writing, so he says, us and you, right? He establishes you in Christ. He anointed us. He placed his seal on us when we trusted in Jesus. Put his spirit into our hearts, himself in us, as a down payment, as a pledge of what is to come. Do you realize what, what he has begun in you? I mean, many of us here are here because we've already met Jesus and had him begin transforming us. He says that is the, the first fruit. It's like the trailer. Right? It's just the beginning 
of the restoration that he wants to do, that he is doing. And, and he says we can be confident that he's going to do it because he's already proven that he has both the, the desire and the ability. And the proof of it is Christ in you. And if you haven't received him, please hear that there's nothing in the way. He says it's a free gift. He desires to give himself to you. If you have questions about that, if you want to pray and receive Jesus and want us to, to walk with you, you can always email us at pastor at Calvary Miami Beach. You can come and pray with us afterwards. But right now, let's take a deeper look into how that works. Verse 12. Therefore, just as through one man, Adam, the first, the first man, right? Through one man, sin entered the world. And death through sin. And thus death spread to all men because all sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. But the free gift is not like the offense, because if by the one man's offense, through Adam's rebellion in the garden, death came to all, many died, much more the grace of, gift of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. And the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned because the judgment which came from one offense resulted in condemnation. But the free gift which came from many offenses resulted in justification. Because if by the one man's offense death reigned through the one, much more those who receive the abundance of grace of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus, the Messiah. Therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation. Even so, through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. Because as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So also, by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more, so that as sin reigned through death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus, the Messiah, our Lord. Point number three is that through Jesus, we receive a new nature, a new humanity, a new way of being human. What he's saying here is that since Adam's rebellion in the garden, humanity has been sinful, corrupt. We are slaves to our lusts, our appetites. We follow them. And if you've ever tried to tame your appetites for very long, you find that if you try to follow God's law without God's spirit in you, you can't. You start, you're, we're incapable of, of keeping it now. And most of the time we don't want to anyways. We want to do things our way. We have a sin nature, the flesh, he calls it, that we're corrupted in that way. But because he loves us, he stepped into that nature to conquer it, lived a sinless life in the flesh, and bore the, the penalty for our sin on himself and conquered it and was resurrected, beginning a new nature. He gave us his spirit to begin that. He is the resurrection and the life. 
it feels mythic, right? I mean, it sounds like fairy tales. He entered into our nature, right, to conquer it and destroy like, it. The fairy tale thing is so ingrained in us that we write all these fairy tales of our own and they always tie back to the true story because there is a true one. We're made to live in this. This is also a good example of why it's really important to read your whole Bible in context because when we read little sections like this, it's really easy to get it twisted up. He warns us about it. That if un, he, in Second Peter, he talks about like unstable, sinful people take these things and twist them to their own destruction. Because if we don't totally want to know God, we can just take a little bit out of context and flip it. And people do that here and say that God has made this free gift applied to all people in the sense that there's no judgment. But he makes it really clear here and throughout Scripture that the gift is available to all people, but we have to embrace it. If you don't want him to transform you, if you insist on staying in the sinful nature, he will let you. We have to cooperate with him. He doesn't just invade. He says whoever looks to him for forgiveness and transformation receives it, not to become less yourself, but to become who you actually are. And if you think about it, this idea of transformation and forgiveness, they have to go hand in hand. Because God's wrath, God's judgment, is not a tantrum from the Creator. He's, it's a judgment. He's saying there's a wickedness that needs to be removed. And He paid the way for it to be removed. But if we refuse to let him do that, he can't just ignore the cruelty and wickedness, violence of our world, right? I mean, my goodness, if we had an example of it lately, right? When you can't just tolerate wickedness because wickedness does damage. But he wants us to receive the transformation. He wants us to be forgiven. He makes it freely available. And I want to think with me for a second about how beautiful this gift is. Because if you haven't known Jesus or haven't thought about this in a while, right? I mean, don't you feel so often like you're not yourself we use that expression all the time. Not myself. That person is not, not themselves today. There's corruption in us that keeps us from being ourselves. And the invitation is to be what you were designed to be in a universe that is going to be made what it was meant to be. We think of it like whitewashing, like sanit you know, just sanitized khaki pants and polo shirts and long dresses, right? But like that, we, we misunderstand righteousness. Think about the word, righteousness. What he's saying is he will make things right, really right. The ocean and sky and your sense of humor and the ways you interact with your friends and make it right. As the band is coming back up, turn with me to Galatians chapter 5. He gives us a contrast here. He says, Galatians chapter 5, verse 19, the, the works of the flesh are evident. The works of the old nature are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, Outbursts of wrath, right? You can't control your temper. Selfish ambition, not all ambition, selfish ambition. Dissensions, heresies, envy, murder, drunkenness, revelry, and the like. And he says elsewhere, we all did these things. We were all guilty. 
and of which I tell you beforehand, as I told you in the past, that those who practice these things, those who choose to continue in these things, will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. He says in Ephesians 4, put off concerning your former conduct the old humanity, the old nature that grows corrupt according to the deceitful appetites. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind that you put on the new humanity that was created according to, through God, in true righteousness and holiness. In 1 Corinthians 12, he says, the manifestation of the Spirit of Christ in you is given to each one for the benefit of everyone. To one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit. To another, the word of knowledge through the Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, healings by the same Spirit. To another, the working of miracles, prophecy, the discerning of the angelic principalities that are around spirits. To another, different kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of the tongues. But one and the same... Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. This is the new nature that he invites you into, and if you have received Jesus, that you have already received. And he says, so walk in it. Talk to him, put it on. He makes it clear that he wants our participation. And that's something that, for me, I've wondered about. Why doesn't he just do it in us, right? Why doesn't he just, just give me the manifestation of the Spirit and just download it? And sometimes he kind of does that with people in different ways. But a lot of times, these, these things, he wants us to go through the process with him. He, he actually talks about, the, there's a sense in which he shares his, his glory with us in the way that he, he wants us to take participation. He doesn't, he doesn't just do it without us. He wants to do it with us. He is so generous. He won the battle at the cross. And now he calls you to fight, to push back the darkness in yourself and in the world around you, the spiritual enemy, not flesh and blood, but spirits, to oppose the works of the enemy. And he says he's doing it with you. He will do it with you and through you. But he calls for your cooperation. So would you stand As we worship, just ask him, is there, where is he calling you to put off the old and to take up, to walk in the new nature?
this week, I encourage you to ask him, where is he inviting you to grow in the fruits or the gifts of the Spirit? Um, and in the homework that they'll put up in a minute, because I have another thing to say first, but in the homework, 1 Corinthians 12 and 13 really speaks to that, to the gifts and the, and the fruits of the Spirit. The other thing to reflect on is just how can you connect more with him, right? How can you grow in the fruits of the Spirit? Is, is there somewhere he's calling you to grow in love, joy, peace, or in the gifts, right, evangelism, prophecy, tongues? Is there something he's inviting you to grow in? And where can you just be connecting more with him? Tuning into the fact that he's present with you, spending time in his word, spending time in prayer. And then for the homework, I encourage you this week to read Matthew 25, John 15, and 1 Corinthians 12 and 13. Just sit with them a little bit throughout your week. That's like four or five pages in your Bible. It won't take a ton of time. I'm not saying you got to do